Hello, guys. Well, today I'll talk to you about an intoxicated patient case study, wherein I will go over the general history of the patient initially, and then we can work upon the clues to arrive at a differential diagnosis and a treatment plan for the most probable diagnosis. So, let's begin. Here we have a 20-year-old male who presents to the emergency department with a friend after drinking one quart of antifree solution in a suicide attack. The patient denies any co-ingestance and denies any abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting. His past medical history is not relevant to this case. The vital checks show the body temperature to be 98.9 degree Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. The heart rate is also within the normal range of 60 to 100 beats per minute. The respiratory rate is slightly elevated and the blood pressure is also within the normal range of systolic being 120 and the diastolic being 80 mm of mercury. Therefore, we derive upon the conclusion that the patient appears to be an intoxicated male but in no acute distress. Going over a systemic physical examination, we say that the patient's pupils are equal and equally reactive to light. His lungs are clear to auscultation. His heart beats a regular rate and rhythm. Upon neurological evaluation, we find that the person is oriented to self and to person only. His cranial nerve second to cranial nerve 12 is intact with no focal deficits. Station is often assessed as part of a mental status to evaluate cognitive functioning and to screen for dementia. It refers to a person's level of awareness of person, place, time and situation. When accessing for a person's orientation, we ask the basic questions like their name, where they are, if they know the date and the time, and if they know why they are where they are, if they know what happened to them. It helps us to determine if the patient is alert, awake, and oriented. Here, in this case, the patient seems to be alert, awake, and oriented to person only, which is often abbreviated as AA and O into one. We want to detecting the causative agent of this patient's present condition. We realize that upon the consumption of antifree solution, the patient ingested a large quantity of ethylene glycol, which led to its toxicity. Ethylene glycol is a colorless, sweet-tasting, odorless, viscous liquid. It is often used as a raw material in polyester manufacturing and in antifreeze formulations similar to the one that a patient here seems to have consumed. The picture here is a clear identification of ethylene glycol in its true nature. This slide further dwells into the properties of ethylene glycol itself, which is a CNS depressant. It is toxic and harmful, but not as much as its metabolic derivatives, including glycoaldehyde, glycolic acid, and oxalic acid. Ethylene glycol is metabolized in the liver and under normal conditions, only a small fraction of absorbed ethylene glycol is unchanged when excreted by the urine. Herein is a picture depicting the metabolism of ethylene glycol for a brief understanding of the process. Ethylene glycol is metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to form glycoaldehyde which is further metabolized by alcohol dehydrogenase to form glycolic acid. Glycolic acid, when accumulated in our body, can lead to profound metabolic acidosis. Besides, 
It also forms oxalic acid, which can then further lead to the formation of calcium oxalate crystals, on par with the metabolic derivatives of ethylene glycol. Excessive amount of lactic acid is also responsible for an iron gap metabolic acidosis. Upon crystal urea, the calcium oxalate crystals are found in these patients as seen in the picture. If left untreated, the half-life of ethylene glycol within children is 2.5 hours and that in adults is 3 to 8 hours. Ethylene glycol can also enter the environment to the disposal of products that contain it. Ethyl glycol in the air will break down in about 10 days, whereas the water and soil will take several days to a few weeks to break it down. The lethal dose of pure ethylene glycol when ingested orally is around 1.4 ml per kilogram. Upon its intoxication, ethyl glycol targets certain systems predominantly. It targets the CNS within the initial hours of its ingestion, leading to seizures and altered mental status. Next, it affects the cardiovascular system and the lungs, wherein it leads to congestive heart failure and compensatory hyperventilation for its metabolic acidosis. And lastly, it affects the renal system, wherein, apart from the crystal urea, which can lead to kidney stones, it also causes acute kidney injury. Here are a few detailed clinical manifestations of a thyroid glycol poisoning. Feel free to pause the video to check those out. Two, to determine how to be certain that the patient's choice of poisoning had been Italian glycol. We check the arterial pH, which is to be less than 7.3. The patient's serum bicarbonate level should be less than 20 millimole per liter. His osmolar gap should be more than 10 milliosmol per liter. And the patient should have calcium oxalate crystalluria. Now guys, amongst all these four criteria that I just listed, if the patient presents with at least three of these criteria, we can safely assume that the poisoning had been that of ethylene glycol. Besides ethylene glycol, antifreeze solutions can also be comprised of propylene glycol and methanol. However, in this case, we can rule those two out as the cost of Asians because propylene glycol ensues normal acid-base equilibrium. However, our patient presented with a wide anion cap metabolic acidosis. Methanol intoxication predominantly cures retinal damage and abdominal pain because of associated pancreatitis. However, the patient denies any abdominal pain and his physical examination shows that his vision is perfectly intact. Once determining the cost of agent, now we move over the treatment plan and symptomatic management. There are several ways to go about it. We can either approach with an aggressive gastric lavage or by IV ethanol infusion or formapazole, both of which would competitively inhibit the metabolism of ethylene glycol by inhibiting alcohol dehydrogenase. However, amongst the two, formapazole is most commonly used. Sodium bicarbonate can be used to treat metabolic acidosis. Calcium chloride can be used to treat the hypercalcemic tetany seen within the initial few hours of ethylene glycol poisoning. However, hemodialysis is the treatment of choice and it should be instituted as soon as possible once the diagnosis is made. Summarizes and conceptualizes everything that we can take home from this case presentation.
So again, feel free to pause the video and go over the slide. Thank you everyone for joining me today.